Good evening, everyone. A special welcome to you this evening. We're glad you've come out. And also, those who are outside, we're asking you to come inside. Welcome to you, Chris. Thank you, Kim. Welcome. Um, it's good to be here tonight. And um, tonight's topic is very important, metabolic health. So, so I'm excited about it. And um, uh, just remember that we've got the children's program in the room to the side. The toilets are kind of like diagonally across from where we are, if you need that. And um, in a minute, we'll go through the questions from last night. Just a reminder that we're going to be off tomorrow night. We're off, and then we have two bumper lectures on Wednesday and Thursday night. And the cooking demo. And we've got a surprise for you on Wednesday night. We're going to have some free DVDs available. So please don't miss Wednesday night. Thank you. All right, so does everyone have one of these? No. Okay. Can we get some? Liam, can you help us out with some of that? Okay, just put up your hand if you, if you need one. And then we'll get one dropped off. Okay, put up your hand if you need one. All right, we managed to... Th thanks, Liam, you're very efficient. <laughs> cool, okay, so um, Dr. Bruce saw how we, um, how we failed last night's test, so he, he gave us only one question. All right, so... Um, in any journey to optimal wellness, nutrition is of paramount importance. Food truly can be medicine. Conversely, it can also be one of the worst poisons. It's what you put in. Our bodies are literally made up of what we choose to internalize. Food may be seen as information. That's right. There is a constant interaction between our nutritional environment and our cells and their genes. Our health is largely a byproduct of this interaction. Cells need amino acids for structure and repair, healthy fats for their membranes, a fuel source to drive energy production for cellular function, vitamins and minerals for biochemical reactions, oxygen as part of cellular en energy production, and antioxidants for protection. The best health outcomes are found with diets that have a plant-based focus. To feel alive, we need to eat living food. The benefits of plant foods are their fiber content, their antioxidant and other protective components, and if chosen and prepared correctly, their slow-releasing sugar properties. Diets based around plant foods reduce the risk of several diseases and conditions. These include cancer, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. The bright colors of plant-based foods also offer significant health benefits. So choose plants, fresh and raw where possible, and eat a diverse array of colors. Your cells will love you for it. Okay, so keep that in, uh, it's a good reminder of last night. So um, Bruce is with us again tonight. Dr. Bruce, thank you for being here in Westville. Um, who's, who's here for the first time? For the first time. Welcome. Welcome. Um, Dr. Bruce has been around the whole world um, in, in various places practicing, and we're lucky to have him here in Westfall. So, over to you. Hi, everyone. Seems like the nutrition lecture might have been a bit heavy. Or something. Um, but I hope you'll get a blessing out of tonight. Um, let's... Let's have a look. I just thought I'd start with a few th thoughts to get us going. We're talking about metabolic health tonight. Um, health once lost is hard to regain. Hard, but possible. I think it's only those people that have lost their health that really start to value health, isn't it? And um, I'm really hoping that even though we've been discussing some fairly complex things, that um, 
that you're starting to get a picture, that a picture is starting to emerge. And even though we're discussing fairly complex biochemistry and physiology, you, you'll see that a lot of the stuff underlying each of these subjects is actually the same. That's why I end up saying the same thing, isn't it? And that's the beauty of, of this kind of medicine, is because it's saying that, like we said in the beginning, there's relatively few things that go wrong in the body when it goes wrong. And if you can focus on those eight or so core things, you can often restore health and healing. Um, this is a very powerful quote from a book called The Ministry of Healing, if you can read it with me. The relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. Disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might well be well if they only thought so. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness. We've seen people like that in the pop, in the health uh, in Hollywood, haven't we? Um, many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness, and the evil effect is produced because it is expected. Many die from disease, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. Isn't that powerful? Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love promote health and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit, is health to the body and strength to the soul. There's a verse in scripture that says, A merry heart rejoice, doeth good like a medicine. But it was the caveat of that says what? But a broken spirit dries up the bones. In the treatment of the sick, the effect of mental influence should not be overlooked. Rightly used, this influence affords one of the most effective agencies for combating disease. Isn't that powerful? And that was written quite a long time ago. And I've seen this. I see people that I'm trying to help, that you're dealing with their biochemistry, you do blood tests, you look at all the results, and you do the right things and you're not getting the results. There's something not happening. And this is the common, this is the often the thing at the base of it. There's emotional trauma, there's psychological distress. And it pays for us to look at our emotional life and see what's going on with our thought life um, and what's the state of our heart and do we have peace. This word, yeah, um, speaks to me. Uh, where is it? A contented mind. A contented mind. When I worked in Ireland, I... I tell the story often because it always stood out in my, my thing, in my head. Um, I walked to the town center and there was a statue there. And I love walking around these little villages all over the world there. That it's, it's really, you learn a lot. Traveling, traveling is such a good education. And the base of the statue simply said, contentment is wealth. Contentment is wealth. And, and sometimes we, we get so conditioned to being ambitious in a worldly way that we never have peace. We think we've got to do this, we've got to earn this, we've got to go to, yeah, we've got to, um, you know, travel there, we've got to do this kind of work, and we're never at rest. And I think the challenge is for us to be ambitious for good things, but to be contented at the same time. Because discontent makes you unhappy. Discontent makes you have a lack of peace. So contentment is wealth. So think about the mental influences in your health and life. How is your mental health? How is your emotional life? Do you have peace? Do you have contentment? There's a field of, called psychoneuroimmunology. Everybody heard of that? So that looks at how the impact of how our thinking and our neurological processes affect our immune system and our endocrine system. Psychoneuro or endocrine in immunology. So how we think affects how well our cells function at an immune system level. This can't be overstated. And if you want to be well, you can focus on your gut as much as you want to or the things that are affecting it, but you need to focus on your thinking and your, your sense of peace and contentment. Right, metabolic health. Um, 
That's just showing some of the energy production pathways in the body. We said the other day when we were looking at carbohydrate metabolism, glucose comes in, goes through a process called glycolysis, goes into a process called the citric acid cycle, releases intermediate compounds which then donate, um, which ultimately uh, converts a compound called ADP into ATP in the presence of oxygen to produce energy, which is ATP. So that's an overview of how you derive energy, at least from a carbohydrate source. Um, but why metabolic health? I must say, this lecture kind of evolved as I was doing it. Uh, I, my intention in, in doing a, a subject on metabolic health was to look at insulin, but we've discussed that at length up to this point. You know, and I was thinking, I really should have a dedicated lecture on carbohydrate metabolism and insulin, and that was my intention in doing metabolic health. But as I was doing it, it kind of evolved into something else. So I'm hoping that what it evolved into will, will, will make sense to you. Uh, metabolism is the set of life-sustaining chemical transformations within the cells of living organisms. These or enzyme catalyzed reactions allow organisms to grow and reproduce, maintain their structures, and respond to the environment. The question we must ask is, how well do you personally process energy? How efficient is your metabolic machinery? What happens, so how well do you process food? What happens when you eat a meal? Because Chris and I can eat the same food. But based on my metabolic state, based on my hormones, based on my fat, based on my inflammation, my inflammatory cytokines, um, my insulin sensitivity, our response to that food can be fundamentally different. And the effect that it, and the way I burn that food can be fundamentally different. So that's interesting, isn't it? It can be exactly the same caloric food, it can be exactly the same food. So the question I'm asking you is how well do you process food? What happens when you eat a meal? How much insulin do you produce? How much inflammation is generated in your system when you eat? How much free radical stress? How efficiently is it used at rest? How much gets turned to fat when you eat? How much do your cells use it and how much gets turned to fat? General principles, we want to generate, I know I've said it a million times or a thousand times, I'm going to keep saying it, we want to generate a low insulin response to your diet. You want to keep your insulin low. Glucose must get into the cells efficiently. Have the right level of nutrients to metabolize it well to produce energy and the right nutrients to protect your mitochondria. Those are the energy producing organelles in your cells. Um, I'll quickly say it while we're talking about insulin again. As you can hear, yeah, I'm fixated on insulin for obvious reasons because it's one of those things that, if it's wrong, affects so many other things, so many other things. So it's worth talking about. When we studied the physiology of the kidney, in med school, um, it told us about the desert rat. And the desert rat has this property that if it, it's, it, the concentrating capacity of the desert rat kidney is so strong that when it urinates, it urinates a puff of smoke. So it, it lives in a harsh environment, so it can't afford to lose water. So the way the desert rat's kidney is designed is to retain as much water as it can, so it urinates a puff of smoke. So it's far more, has far more concentrating capacity than yours and mine has. And it, I don't know why, maybe just just crazy thinking of myself at the time, but that sort of stuck in my head as to how things should work with insulin. Your metabolism, your hormone processing capability must be so efficient that when glucose gets into your bloodstream, your pancreas just must have to release a puff of insulin, just a little tsh, and it must disappear into your cells. Think of it that way. So when you think of your pancreas and insulin, think of the desert rat. You want a puff of insulin, just tsh, and then the, the glucose is gone. But what's happening is because of how we're living in our calorie diets and our nutrient-poor diets, as I keep saying, the tissues aren't responding, so the pancreas is flooding. It's, it's losing lots of, u of urine into the blood. Okay. So that, that, that's a helpful analogy. Um, this is what we want. We've all heard of high and low glycemic index foods. So the glycemic index just tells you how quickly a given amount of sugar gets into your bloodstream when you eat it. So if you take 50 grams of pure glucose and you compare it, if you eat a carrot, um, the fiber in the carrot is, and the sugar content is going to be different, of course, but it's going to control how quickly that glucose gets into your, into your circulation, which in turn is going to control how quickly your pancreas releases insulin and how much insulin it releases. So, and how much insulin releases is related to how much of total carbohydrates in the food as well. So there's glycemic index and glycemic load. But you want to be eating 
diets that release sugars slowly and therefore release insulin slowly. It causes a, a, a low insulin spike. So if you're eating a diet, having Coke as your fuel, that's what's happening to your blood glucose. Your pancreas goes into like shock and says, hey, I can't have this. Because like glucose in the, in the circulation is like rocket fuel. It doesn't belong there. We said that glucose damages the endothelium. High glucose damages your endothelium. So the pancreas got to flood it with insulin to get rid of it. So you need to eat foods that have low amounts of total carbohydrate. I mean, reasonable amounts that are released slowly. And plant foods meet that description. That's my car. You like it? <laughs> Hopefully, through appropriate choices, we can develop metabolisms like a Ferrari. A, fer a Ferrari doesn't butt, butt, butt along the road, does it? It purrs and it sings sweetly. So when you think of your metabolism, think of this beautiful Ferrari. Some of us have metabolisms like this. <laughs> that when we eat and how we process nutrients, we do so rather inconsistently and misfiring, <laughs> chugging along. So that one or that one, you choose. If you metabolize like that, you'll end up looking like this. And if you look like that, you'll metabolize like that. So that's important. Do you need a tune-up? <laughs> I think many of us need a metabolic tune-up. And we need to, so tonight was just to look at some of the factors that is negatively affecting our metabolism and how to remedy some of those. So give yourself a metabolic tune-up. For optimal metabolism, so again, just to emphasize, I'm using the word metabolism quite generically to describe the whole set of circumstances or reactions that are happening in your system when you process food. Um, from your hormone responses to your cellular enzyme activity to how efficiently that is used to how much of it becomes fat, your basal metabolic rate, that's the way I'm using metabolism tonight. Um, so to have optimal, uh, optimal metabolic process, you need optimal body mass. We'll see why. Optimal levels of hormones, optimal nutrients, healthy fuel. Healthy people have healthy metabolic rates. The aim is not to have a good metabolic rate. The aim is to be healthy. And if you're healthy, you'll have a healthy metabolic rate. Does that make sense? And I, only that sort of, I was like putting the cart before the horse while I was preparing this lecture, and it sort of dawned on me, what, what are you actually trying to say here? But that's what I'm trying to say, is that healthy people have healthy metabolic rates. Uh, the aim is not to aim for a healthy metabolic rate. Um, so basal metabolic rate is an estimate of how many calories you'd burn if you would do nothing but rest for 24 hours. If you stayed in bed tomorrow, did nothing, just breathed. At rest, the, your basal metabolic rate is how many calories you would burn and need to sustain your heart function and your basic vital organ function. So that's the definition of your basal metabolic rate. And that can be calculated. There are formulas to look at that. Um, so the question is, what's your idling speed? That's a useful concept. How well does your metabolic machinery idle? How efficient is it? The strength of your internal metabolic fire. How quickly do you churn through calories? Um, are you purring or are you misfiring? It represents the amount of energy needed to... Okay, we've said that. Body composition fundamentally affects your basal metabolic rate. How much of your body is fat versus muscle? Muscle is more metabolically active. That's important. So I've said this often in these seminars. What you must remember, we've become a society fixated on our weight. How many kilograms? And um, the important thing is what's your body composition? How much of your weight is fat? How much of your weight is lean muscle? And we'll see later on, you must, as you get older, throughout our lives, you must maintain muscle mass. You must do everything in our power to maintain a good muscle mass. Um, there's a process called sarcopenia, which is where you progressively lose muscle as you age, and there are reasons for that. But part of maintaining a healthy meta metabolism to keep you purring is to have healthy muscle mass. So the more of your body that becomes fat, the less healthy you become, which is intuitive, but we need to think about the proportions of what, what your weight comprises. Um, hormonal health and balance affected, how we move, exercise affects your metabolic rate. What influences your BMR? Your BMR can be influenced by factors, so that's your basal metabolic rate, your BMR, influenced by genetics. So genetics, you can inherit, I didn't put that on there, yes I did. 
So you can inherit a sluggish type metabolism. Doesn't mean you predestined to stay with it, but you can inherit a slower type metabolism. Your body size, your age, your gender, hormones, and what you eat. The amount of exercise you do can have an effect as well. Can you see all right? Sorry. Sorry. So these are some foods that actually increase your metabolic rate. If you want to fire up the metabolic machinery, these are some foods that have an impact. Jalapeno peppers, dark leafy greens, poppy seeds, cinnamon, oregano, grapefruit, parsley, mustard seeds, garlic, marjoram, broccoli, that's a superfood. Spinach, mint, ginger, cayenne pepper, dill. Those are some foods that help to potentiate your metabolic machinery. So diet has an impact on how well you metabolize, how well you process calories. Exercise and BMR. How does exercise affect your basal metabolic rate? Um, so it does so principally by increasing your amount of muscle. Because we've said, and this is an important point to get, more muscle you have, muscle is more metabolically active than fat. So if 50% if of my body, hopefully not, 50% of my body was fat, um, it's, it's less metabolically active than muscle. So my, my resting rate, the rate at which I need to consume calories or, or burn up calories is far less than someone who's muscular and lean. So one of the ways to improve and tune up your metabolic machinery is to do resistance training and get your muscles strong and bigger and get more of your body lean muscle rather than fat. Um, you know, a lot of guys go to gym just to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, you know, obviously the way you look is important. And that's important for your identity and how you feel about yourself. But exercise does so much more than that. And we must exercise for the right reason. Um, and so one of the ways to positively affect your BMR is to get your, to your ideal body composition, getting your ideal um, lean muscle mass as far as possible. And as I said, as you get older, you get the sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is just a fancy word for muscle wasting. When you get older, you, you lower your, your androgens like testosterone, they get lower. Testosterone helps to maintain lean muscle mass. And you get muscle wasting. So if you look at an old man's legs, he often has a big pendulous abdomen and he has these little sticks for legs, and you see there's not much muscle on them. He's lost his hormones, and um, so he looks like a little apple on a stick. And, and you've, got, you've, got to, you've got to maintain that muscle tissue. And the way to do that, you've got to use it. So it's use it or lose it. So we should be encouraging resistance training that's age appropriate for as long as possible. Appropriate diet for as long as possible. And, and those things help to maintain youthful levels, more youthful levels of hormones for as long as possible. Makes sense, eh? So tips for boosting your BMR. Avoid quick weight loss diets or detox diets. One of the arguments is if you, if you starve yourself to lose fat, you actually slow your metabolic rate down because the body goes into a starvation mode. So it says, I've got to conserve energy. I'm not getting anything in shock. So the advice is to have a graded or you know, slow loss of weight so that you don't shock your body into actually slowing your rate down. That's the first thing. Increasing physical activity or changing your exercise program will help. We're going to look a bit at that. Um, include two sessions of strength training each week. Building more muscle, as we said, will boost your BMR. Eat breakfast. Some research suggests a relationship between eating breakfast and lowering your BMR, which may happen in part by kickstarting your metabolic rate. Be careful to eat a nutritional breakfast. You can adjust the remainder of your daily collegial intake depending on your needs and goals. Um, so we'll look at the, the last one. Just look at the thyroid. One of the hormones that really impacts your metabolic rate is your thyroid hormone. We spoke a bit about it in the hormone section the other night. And as we said, that most, most people are not getting a thorough thyroid hormone assessment. They're getting a TSH at the most. Now, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. But you're having an underactive thyroid, and there are many things that can cause that. It's one of the things that can really set you back metabolically. So if you're battling to lose weight, one of the hormonal causes can be underactive thyroid. And um, it often is what we call subclinical. It's, it can be quite subtle. And uh, so if you really have struggled with weight loss issues and you're really doing your part, you know, perhaps check your thyroid out. That's important if, if somebody hasn't done that. Thyroid hormone affects nuclear, um, affects your DNA, basically. Some of the metabolic effects, you know, some people actually use thyroxin as a weight loss tool because of this mechanism, which I don't advocate. Um, that's not good medicine. That's misuse. And when you and the problem is, when when it comes to to hormones and hormones using hormones appropriately, if you take a hormone, you're always going to have a negative effect downstream if you're overdoing it. 
So you, you're probably going to suppress your own production if you're taking too much. So, but people do that because of this mechanism. Thyroid, thyroid hormone bumps up your met metabolism. And two of the things it does is it affects your lipid metabolism. Increased thyroid hormone levels stimulate fat mobilization, leading to increased concentration of fatty acids in the plasma. They also enhance oxidation of fatty acids in many tissues. Um, fun and also affect your carbohydrate metabolism. Thyroid hormone stimulates almost all aspects of carbohydrate metabolism, including enhancements of insulin-dependent entry of glucose into cells and increased gluconeogenesis, blah, 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 blah. So thyroid hormones affecting your metabolic rate by affecting your lipid and your carbohydrate metabolism. So, um, but definitely don't abuse thyroxin to get this effect. That's really not good. Insulin. Just briefly, more insulin, more fat. Change, changes your body composition. So the more insulin your body's pumping out, insulin's an anabolic hormone. It keeps fat from breaking down, builds your body up, and it will, by increasing, your, your more, increasing the, amount, the degree to which your body is fat, it will potentially negatively impact your BMR. Keep your insulin levels low, your thyroid, and your androgens at healthy levels. So hormonal balance is, is critical if you want to maintain a healthy metabolism. Um, so factors that increase your metabolic rate, lean body mass, physical activity and exercise, growth and development, being male, that's largely because of testosterone and muscle mass, uh, heart, stress, digestion, they increase your metabolic rate. Factors that decrease it, aging, fat mass, starvation and dieting, sedentary living, being female, sleep, <laughs> ladies have some advantages and we have some advantages, we've got to have some. You know? <laughs> Most of the ladies are outliving us, did you notice? They are. Um, so, this is an important organelle in your cells. This is the mitochondrion. And this has a critical role to play in the efficiency of your cellular respiration, we call it. So, your cells respire or they process compounds to produce energy in the presence of oxygen. That process is called respiration. Um, cellular respiration. Um, so the mitochondrion is a very important little organelle that we've really got to protect if you want to maintain healthy cellular energy production and aging. Um, and these little organelles are really damaged by oxidative stress. So the more oxidative stress we have, the more nutrient depleted diets we have, the more these little organelles suffer. They consist of two membranes, an outer and an inner, strangely enough. Um, and the chemical reactions that produce the ATP happen within these structures. How do you fine-tune your mitochondria? So now we're talking at a, we're not, where do the mitochondria sit? The mitochondria sit inside the cell, and they produce the ATP to drive the cellular processes. So that's where the pro mitochondria are sitting. No mitochondria, a very tired cell. In inefficient mitochondria, a tired cell, a tired you, wherever that cell is and whatever it's doing. So you've got to look after your mitochondria. And as I keep saying, the nice thing about lifestyle medicine is that you don't have to go home and think, I'm going to look after my mitochondria. By doing the right things, you look after your mitochondria. Just remember that. But you, it's nice to know what you're doing by doing those good things. So, to look after your mitochondria will help you age well. Um, you must eliminate processed, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor food. Sound familiar? I think we spent a lot of the last night talking about that. Eating whole foods whole grains, if you eat refined foods, they're nutrient poor, and they actually cause rusting. They cause a lot of oxidative stress. These, these mitochondria are extremely sensitive to oxidative damage. So if, you don't, if you're having processed foods that are nutrient depleted, you're not getting the kind of nutrients to protect those mitochondria in the function. So eat uh, whole foods, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, fruit, and veg. Balance your hormones, stop inflammation. Interval training. This is interesting. Does anybody know what interval training is? You must have heard of high intensity interval training. High intensity interval training. Um, try this tomorrow. How many run in the room? How many run in the mornings? Okay, so a few. A few hands. When, when you go running tomorrow. I went running this morning, so I can talk about it. Yay. Um, when you're running tomorrow, try and do interval training. So how are you going to breathe? You're going to breathe through your nose. So you're going to breathe, and you must get into a rhythm, because I find if you don't start with the rhythm right, you don't get your breathing right. And I'm really experiencing with this. And my weight's coming down. I'm not saying that's the only thing. I'm trying to get to my ideal body composition. I need to. And um, so my weight's coming down, 
and focus on your breathing when you start. You might find your nose will run as your carbon dioxide level goes a little bit higher and when the morning air is cold. And um, try and do little sprints. So push yourself for at least 30 to 60 seconds, breathing through your nose. When you get tired, drop back and just jog gently until you've recovered, breathing through your nose. Push yourself 60 seconds, stop, come back. So you're doing start-stop training. And what they've said is, Vaughn, you're going to try it. <laughs> Can you film it for us? <laughs> so what they said that that does, what they're finding is that increases the number of mitochondria that you have in your cells. So basically the whole body's designed on what you use and potentiate, you get more of. Does that make sense? So to, to exercise like this, you, you need faster metabolism. You need your cellular machinery to be more efficient. So the body upregulates what you're needing. So it upregulates your mitochondria. And um, so you get increasing numbers. Uh, sorry, yeah. In, increasing efficiency, sorry. sorry. And when you do strength training, if you go to the gym and build your muscles, you get increasing numbers. So interval cardiovascular exercise tends to improve the efficiency of your mitochondria, how well they process things, whereas strength training increases the number. So part of tuning up your metabolism is mastering your mitochondria, mastering your mitochondrial health. Um, so the way you exercise can affect that. What you eat will affect that. Um, some mitochondrial energizers, if you really want to tune them nicely, you can get supplements that optimize mitochondrial function, things like acetyl L-carnitine, alpha-lipoic acid. Anybody heard of alpha-lipoic acid? Coenzyme Q10. That's a very common antioxidant you must have heard of. Those of you who are on statins, which is a subject we can talk about, but you must take coenzyme Q10 if you're on a statin because statins stop your coenzyme Q10 production and they, it's counterproductive. D-ribose in um, ADH. Toxins, allergens, stress, and poor diet damage the mitochondria. We said eat whole, real, colorful plant food. Those are some other things that can affect its function. When your hormones go out of balance, hormones affect your metabolism. There's two ways of approaching hormone imbalances. There's what we call the replacement model, which is if you're deficient in estrogen, we replace your estrogen. That's called the replacement model. But then there's another model that says, well, what's causing the hormone imbalance? And if you treat the cause, you don't need a supplement, um, which makes a lot more sense from a functional mindset. So hormones don't become unbalanced for a reason. If you're battling with hormonal imbalance, there's a reason. There's a nutrient deficiency, a toxin, an inflammatory process, uh, a gut issue, a liver issue, uh, a stress issue. Um, these are some of the things that unbalance our hormonal systems. As I said, the gut microbiome, those are the, gut, the bacteria that are living in your gut, are linked to hormone imbalance. They've actually classified it as the estrobolome, which is basically the total sum of the bacterial DNA that helps to process estrogen. And it affects which, how much estrogen is being recycled, what type of estrogen. So the gut flora, the bugs in your gut, can affect how you process hormones and their levels. Dysbiosis, which is also the gut flora, can lead to intestinal permeability, leading to inflammation, which cortisol dysregulation and HPA dysfunction, cortisol excess can lead to receptor resistance. If a hormone level is high all the time, like insulin, the receptors can get desensitized to that hormone. So the more stressed you are, your the cortisol can, for instance, stop having its net effect on the cells because the cells are becoming less responsive to cortisol. So you can sometimes take your, your hormone levels and have normal levels and um, still not be functioning properly because you've had high levels some at some time and your cells have become resistant. Um, stress affects your which glands? Adrenals. So remember I showed you that steroid pathway. When you stress a long time, your body's got to maintain cortisol production. It does so at the expense of DHEA, um, which balances the cortisol, and um, that's called pregnenolone steel. Insulin and leptin resistance, poor diet, lack of exercise, and inadequate sleep, insulin resistance can lead to high cortisol. Do you know that if you go to bed too late, you actually put yourself at risk of insulin resistance? Did you know that? So the later you go to bed, the more metabolically deranged you're becoming. So if you want to keep your insulin signaling nice and nice and sensitive, go to bed early. The best advice I can give you about sleep, which we're still going to talk about, go to bed early and get up early. 
no matter how old you are. Go to get it early, get up early. After this lecture, which you can hopefully finish soon, go straight to bed. <laughs> and don't eat. Don't eat. Um, you must have planned your meal so that you've eaten enough before you go to bed. Okay. Um, Insulin surges can upregulate 1720 lyase. That's a, an enzyme which can increase testosterone production and cause PCOS or infertility in ladies. So the hormones all work together. Um, liver detoxification issues, phase one and phase two imbalances. Remember I said that the liver detoxifies compounds in two separate steps? If you've got imbalances in those two steps, that can affect hormone processing, and you can get what they call Franken hormones. Um, basically, the hormones that are not being metabolized properly can still affect the receptor and compete with normal hormones for that receptor activity, but still not, but not actually stimulate that receptor. So through having liver detoxification issues, which are nutrient dependent, uh, depending on your diet and all sorts of factors, your gut health, you can have hormone imbalances. So that's another cause of hormone imbalance. So this is just looking at some of the things that mess up our hormones, because you want to sort out those factors instead of just replacing what you think is missing. Environmental toxins and methylation impairment. Too much omega-6 can lead to altered hormone receptor function. And this omega-6 uh, linoleic acid is found in industrially processed plant oils like soybean and corn oil, safflower and sunflower oil. As we said last night, most of us are getting too much omega-6 relative to our omega-3. And too much omega-6 can mess up your hormonal function. So ways to balance your hormones. Eat a nutrient-dense anti-inflammatory diet. Um, avoid some of the modern foods now. Remember, the things that cause inflammation are myriad. Sugar causes inflammation. Insulin causes inflammation. Food allergies cause inflammation. Subtle, ongoing, chronic, unremitting infections cause inflammation. Um, but from a, from a dietary perspective, there's many foods that actually by nature stimulate an inflammatory process. So that's why I said to you, when I'm asking about your metabolism, how well are you processing food? How much insulin do you produce? How much free radical stress do you produce? How much antioxidants, uh, how much inflammation are you producing? Um, and the greater the disparity between your, well, the greater amount of insulin resistance that you have, the greater the metabolic mayhem whenever you eat. So if you're insulin resistant, if you're not responding well to your insulin, you have a meal, which might be a healthy meal, um, Obviously, it does depend on the meal as to what the reaction is going to be. But you can have a meal. And if you've got a great disparity in your insulin sensitivity, you're going to pump out a lot of insulin in response to that meal instead of a small amount. That's what we keep saying. That high insulin is going to increase your cancer risk while it's high. It's going to increase your BMI risk. It's going to increase your hypertensive risk. It's going to be a pro-inflammatory stimulus. So this is, this is how I'm trying to get you to conceptualize metabolism. How are you processing what you're internalizing? And what are the things that are affecting that, and how do you optimize that? So the question you must ask is after your meal is, have I generated a puff of, puff of smoke like the desert rat, or have I generated a flood of insulin, which is causing metabolic derangement? Um, those are some of the important things to be aware of, and you can test for those. And change your lifestyle to stop it, because that's what, it's, the, it's the response to what you've eaten based on your individual physiology where you're at in terms of weight and optimal hormones and inflammatory status and health, that is determining the consequences of that high, you know, uh, that high uh, insulin. Um, so if you manage stress, you can save your HPA axis, enough quality sleep and exercise. Kids are not getting enough sleep. What are they doing? We've given them iPads, smartphones, and both of which release blue light, which they're using in bed at night, which is switching off their melatonin. This guy that I was reading, he says that 12-year-old kids should be getting about 10 hours of sleep. And those of you that got 12-year-old kids, how many hours of sleep are they getting? And what are they using? Remember, if you're trying to optimize, excuse me, so, so kids need to sleep well to generate a growth hormone response. They need to repair. They need to do so to get balanced hormones. Um, so if you really want to do your child a favor, take away all electronic devices four to six hours before sleep. And, and, well, maybe not that long, but I mean as long as you can. Um, because that blue light is messing with their physiology. And, and you're controlling, you're affecting how the, the quality of their sleep. 
Um, and remember, the quality of your sleep is affecting your metabolism, specifically via your insulin, is, is one of the mechanisms. And so you want, to, you want to help them. TV. TV's in the room. Don't belong in the room. Um, so at night time, we must put off as many lights as possible. We should have this lecture by candlelight to really look after our melatonin and our hormones. Um, but you get the point. Limit your light exposure. Factors which slow your metabolism, age. As we age, our meta metabolism naturally slows. One of the mechanisms they think that, that causes that is that um, our testosterone drops. Testosterone is one of the hormones that really keeps, your, keeps you purring like that Ferrari. And as your testosterone drops with age, your metabolism, your metabolic rate drops. Um, so testosterone also keeps your muscle mass up, which keeps your BMR up. Stress um, slows your metabolism. Lack of sleep changes your metabolism. Eating too much fat can change your metabolism. Medications uh, can change your metabolism, things like antidepressants, um, certain diabetic medications. So if you're having a battle to lose weight, sometimes the medication that you're taking to help you can work against you and slow your metabolic rate. So the best way to treat lifestyle diseases is through lifestyle change. I'm not saying there's no place for medication. I'm saying first start by trying to treat the causes. That's what we're talking about. Um, and the causes are the reason we get sick, our guts are messed up, we're inflamed, we're toxic, we're antioxidant depleted, hormonally deranged, <laughs> and um, you know, we need to get those things back in balance. There's reasons we get sick. Health, uh, hypothyroidism we know, we've spoken about eating too little, uh, lack of exercise. We've spoken about interval training. Um, so this is the response of basal metabolic rate to increasing or advancing age, both in men and women. Um, so how do we fan the metabolic flame? Like we're sitting now with a metabolic rate that's at X as we're sitting here. Um, how do we increase this? How do we construct it? We've spoken about strength training. Strength training, lifting a bit of weights, doing some push-ups. Um, it's important to maintain the muscle mass in your, in, your core, in your core muscles and in the big muscle groups, the pec group and the quads. So, so do keep your muscle mass up. Strength training can reduce age-related metabolic slowdown by 50%. That's big. It's massive. When you run or swim or walk, do the burst sessions we've spoken about. Omega-3s, make some muscle. Um, that's fine. When you exercise, you can actually, if you exercise right, you can increase the afterburn effect. You can actually rev up your metabolism for quite a while after you've exercised. And that's, so one of the things that's always often been advocated when you exercise um, is try not to eat for about an hour after you've exercised because you maximize your fat burning capacity after that, in that period after your exercise. Um, get started in the morning. Make sure you eat breakfast. Eating a nutrient-rich morning meal like oatmeal with almonds and berries wakes up your metabolism. So the right breakfast fires up the engine. Eating breakfast gets the engine going and keeps it going. According to the National Weight Control Registry, an ongoing study that tracks 5,000 people who lost an average of 66 pounds and kept it for more than five years, 78% of these people who kept it off eat a morning meal every day. That's quite significant. So, you know how many people I speak to say, no, I don't like breakfast. And I don't eat breakfast. And do you know why that is often? It's because we've had a late meal the night before. So, if you want to be hungry for breakfast, you want to be having the, the right um, meal planning the day before. If you want to sleep well, you want to have the right meal planning. So, um, breakfast, as it's always been said, is the most important meal of the day, and it is the most important meal of the day. But you won't be hungry for it if you've been doing the wrong things the day before. Trans fats. Trans fats slow down your met metabolism. They affect um, your liver cells. Um, adequate protein can also favorably affect your metabolism. To lose weight, you must change your diet, fix your gut, stop your inflammation, fix your hormones, exercise and build and retain lean muscle, tune up and master your metabolism, you can do it. Um, you know what? You really can do it. This, the nice thing about the human body is once you start to understand the machinery, and I'm really trying to apply these things to my own life at the moment. I've spent my last few years, my nose in books, learning, but now I must apply it. And um, this, once you know the rules and you apply it, you start to see the results. 
and you can do it. Um, but you've got to set yourself goals and say what you want. You know, um, that's the first step. So the practical take-home message for your metabolism, aim for and attain your ideal body composition. That's healthy. You want a healthy amount of fat, not excessive fat. Uh, include some interval training, burst-type exercise in your daily program. Uh, in fact, what I was reading today, you don't actually have to do that that often in the week if you do it properly. If you alternate some interval training, if you do like cycles of about five cycles in your day, um, and I think you do that probably for two or three times a week, you have an impact, a favorable impact. Um, and so you want to combine that kind of interval burst training with, and obviously you've got to consider where you're at. I'm not saying you're all going to become super athletes, but, but balance that with some strength training and resistance training. Do some push-ups, do some sit-ups, get some barbells or dumbbells, dig in the garden, do some practical stuff. The best kind of exercise is actually um, practical stuff that we do outdoors. We get multiple benefits by being in the sun, by working in the garden. Um, balance, your horm balance your hormones, insulin, thyroid, and cortisol. Eat for health and life, not emotionally. Become a lean, mean, super fat fighting machine. Don't you want to be that? Um, you know, we've got too much fat sitting in the wrong places. And as, 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 I, as I said before, you've got subcutaneous fat and then you've got visceral fat. Okay, so you want to get rid of that fat that's sitting around the organs. Um, because that's the fat that really kills you. It's that visceral fat, the fat that's sitting between your kidneys and your gut, that's releasing the pro-inflammatory cytokines, that's affecting your insulin sensitivity, that's affecting your cardiovascular risk. Subcutaneous fat is the fat just under the skin. So it's often the fat that you don't really see, this, or the stuff that's really making your abdomen pendulous, um, is the dangerous killer fat. You want to get rid of that stuff. So you must know what it is and attain your ideal body fat composition. Um, so become a lean, mean, super fat fighting machine. And if you choose the right things and do the right things, you can do that. Um, but it's about being healthy. It's not about just achieving that end. So hopefully you'll end up with a metabolism that looks like that and not that old follow in the beginning. Um, thank you. That's tonight's lecture. Thanks very much. Sure. All right. Uh, we spoke about insulin resistance and how having too much insulin is bad for you. <clears throat> However, uh, people that uh, get diabetes, they, they fat and they inject themselves with insulin because they supposedly don't have enough insulin. So how does one uh, transcend that apparent contradiction? Yeah. Two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune condition where you get an attack of the pancreatic islet cells that produce the, the, the insulin, so you don't have enough to start with. Type 2 diabetics come on because of a combination of lifestyle factors and interacting with their genes. So what happens is they become resistant, the glucose isn't getting in, the body makes, the pancreas makes more insulin. They get some glucose in. They become more resistant, the body has to make more insulin. More resistant, the body makes more insulin. Like that dam I showed you, the water keeps backing up. Comes to a point where the pancreas says, are you crazy? I can't actually produce any more insulin. I can only, you've got this dam wall that's come up to here now, I've got this much water. And that's when you become diabetic as a type 2 diabetic. And then because you haven't reversed those blockage factors sufficiently, the weight gain, the inflammation, the receptor sensitivity, the doctor has very little choice but to give you more insulin. And the irony is that it's that insulin that's killing you. That high insulin is increasing your cardiovascular risk, increasing your cancer risk. So we're giving you the thing because we've been taught, and it's true, that high glucose is not allowed. It's damaging your endothelium. So we've got to get rid of that glucose. But the only thing in our arsenal, because the blockage is still there, is to give you more insulin because your pancreas can no longer cope. So if you're a type 2 diabetic and you've been changed now to have insulin in your regimen, I'm dealing with a patient just like that. I'm, I'm at that tense moment where the sugar is still, still up. And I know my medical training says I can't leave a patient with the blood sugar still sitting up. So I've got to get it down, but I'm going to give her the hormone that's going to make her more fat and increase her cardiovascular risk and increase her cancer risk. The secret is to break down the wall. Well, that's what we've been talking about, is that you exercise, you change your, your, your um, body fat composition, you change your diet, um, you use some natural minerals to help, like chromium, um, 
to help restore some of that sensitivity, but the key factor is weight loss. Weight loss and exercise. When you exercise, your body upregulates GLUT4 receptors. So, so when I exercise, it actually, it actually upregulates the receptors that help me take the glucose out of the circulation. So the lifestyle factors, so the way to reverse that is to do the, th do the things correctly that cause it in the first place. And the things that cause it is the calorie-dense, nutrient-poor diet um, in excess, um, the inactivity, and some genetic predispositions. You've got to work with those things to reverse the blockage so you can get the insulin down. That's the way to solve it. As long as, my, you know, a diabetic will come in very proud and say, hey, my blood sugar is under control, but he's taking 25 units of, of Lantus or Protophan at night. And that's a sign that his pancreas is like finished, and now we're giving extra insulin, which is increasing his risk even further. Now, I'm not saying you mustn't take insulin. I'm saying it's a fine line to find. Because if I don't give insulin, and this is the dilemma I'm having with this patient, if I don't give her insulin, the glucose is going to stay 8, 9, fasting. But if I give her insulin, she's going to get more weight, potentially. And so it's that balance you've got to find. So I'm, I'm really trying to focus on her lifestyle change to try and ward off on giving her insulin as long as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, look, other hormones are important, cortisol um, and things. But I mean, you know, the, the, the factors that cause insulin resistance are, are quite well known, and those are the kind of things that outlined, yeah. Sure, thanks. Great. And do you, any more questions? There we go. <clears throat> Your comments on banting diet and car carbo. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> um, as I said last night, when you approach the subject of nutrition, I do so very humbly. I tried, to, I tried to, last night, give you the principles of good nutrition. Um, one of the, I like to look at pros and cons. One of the good things of banting is that it gets your insulin down. Because you've, you've taken, it, taken away all of the stimulus to insulin, which is your carbohydrates largely. Um, Remember the, the different macronutrients, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates generate a different insulin release at a pancreas level. Um, so when you change your composition or your, of your macronutrient intake, you affect how much insulin is required. So it does get your insulin down. My concerns with banting are it's a very animal protein-based diet. And we looked at last night that one of the concerns with animal proteins is that it increases your cancer risk. Not only that, we're living in a time where animal proteins are not raised in a very healthy way. Um, they're full of estrogens and hormones, full of antibiotics, um, and they're fiber deficient. There's no fiber whatsoever in animal proteins. And, and so you, you relying on a protein source that increases your cancer risk, we showed you that last night, um, that makes you more acidic, which increases your osteoporotic risk, uh, whereas a plant-based diet is fiber rich, and we and we said that the um, the gut bacteria depend on a good fiber content to be healthy and keep you healthy. So, it is my personal opinion that if you, and this is my humble personal opinion from my reading that I'm extrapolating, um, uh, I, I think if you do the factors that try and restore your insulin sensitivity by controlling your caloric intake, by tr controlling the type of foods you're using, by increasing your exercise, and you try and potentiate that sensitivity and restore that normal carbohydrate sensitivity, that you are best off on a whole foods plant-based diet. And the thing is, you must remember with banting, is that a lot of people are losing weight. They are. But we, this is short-term still. It's a short-term thing. We haven't seen the long-term downstream consequences of this diet. And one of the comments that that a friend of mine raised um, is also that it's almost you, the big argument with banting, which is really interesting, and this is quite a, so it's a very, very big question you've asked. Um, it, its whole premise is that what is the preferential fuel source for the human body? Are we designed to run on carbohydrates or are we designed to run on fat? Because the, the, the fundamental operating principle of banting is that we're designed to operate on, run on fat. One of the contentions that I've heard is that your body uses fat metabolism in extreme fasting type situations as an emergency measure. So one of the concerns that I've heard, which does seem to make sense, is that you're forcing your body to, into this starvation mode as a 
baseline operating model. So some of the good things in the short term, you're lowering your insulin and losing weight, great. Some of the concerns, it's, a, it's an animal protein-based diet. It's, it's quite dependent on that. We've showed the risk of, of cancer. We've showed the risk of osteoporosis. We've showed the risk of the fact that animal foods are full of hormones, often full of antibiotics, uh, and fiber deficient. And on the other hand, if you're eating a plant-based focused diet, you're getting a lot of fiber antioxidants. And we said last night, we're not getting... The, 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 things, the diseases we're facing are what? Cardiovascular disease and cancer. We're not getting those things because we don't have enough meat and fat in our diet. I don't think anybody would say that. We're getting those things because we are insulin resistant, or we've messed up our metabolisms. We're not eating enough protective plant compounds which have the antioxidants, the phytosterols, the phytochemicals. So that's my humble summary intake of it, uh, a summary overview of it. I hope that makes sense. But um, whole foods, plant-based, no refined foods. I do not support, we, we cannot support refined foods. They mess with your metabolism. Foods as grown with everything on them that they were grown with. So instead of jungle oats, you get rolled oats. Because rolled oats has the whole thing on it. As soon as you polish stuff and you take stuff off, you affect the metabolism of that food. Hmm. Um, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll have time for one more question. A couple of short ones. One, um, Mealy meal porridge. Place for that? Yeah. I, 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 again, you get mealy meal and mealy meal. I think there's different <laughs> grades of refining of mealy meal. If you're eating the whole stuff um, and balancing with other stuff, you know, absolutely. Absolute place for it. I think, again, it depends where you're at with your physiology. As I say, if you, if you particularly got a weight issue and you're trying to lose weight, one wants to perhaps minimize some of the starchy stuff a little bit and balance more the protein content, you know, with nuts and legumes and seeds and stuff. Um, so you might alter your portions, I think, when you're trying to get back to optimal. But when you're eating whole foods, your body metabolizes it in a, in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. If the stuff's unrefined, um, it comes with the nutrients for the metabolic process. So obviously you might, as I said, play around with your, your, your portion size and your proportions of your macronutrients. Um, but whole foods inherently facilitate their own metabolism. Good. The second one is water. You've talked about water quality and when to have them. Can you give us some indication of how much we should drink? There's sometimes people say drink two or three yeah. liters a day and yeah. others say drink to, to dryness, you know, just to quench thirst. But what, what's your thoughts on those? Man? Yeah, I've read a lot about that. I mean, I agree with you that there's, you know, we've always said two liters a day and eight glasses a day and, and I don't think we can be prescriptive. Um, you know, we can give rough, rough estimates, but as you know, um, you, your water intake's based on your insensible losses, your losses in the urine, your losses in the stool, your losses just standing here breathing, we're losing water. Um, so you want to replace those and, and have sufficient. Um, a rough barometer guide, they say, is to drink enough to keep your urine clear. Um, if you're drinking enough to keep your urine unconcentrated, that's a good indication. Um, you know, um, I've also heard, it, yeah, so, so, I mean, if, if you're going to start with about six, six glasses a day between meals and see how you go with your urine concentration, um, I think that's a, a general rough appropriate guideline. Um, but, yeah, obviously it varies according to how, your age. If you have a comorbid condition, if you're losing, you know, if you have an enteral illness, um, those will change your water requirements, obviously. But. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, if, there are any, if there are any other questions, let's, let's jot them down. We have the question box um, at the back. So if you've got any questions, put, put, put your questions down there, maybe your email address as well, and then we can, we can uh, try our best to answer those. Thank you, Chris. So we're going to have some chair massages afterwards. If you'd like to come and sit down and relax for a few moments. And then we're having tomorrow night off. An off night. Get to bed early tomorrow night, okay? <laughs> and, um, and then Wednesday night we're back. Remember we have some DVDs in store for you. And on Thursday night we have the cooking demonstration at 5.30. And then our regular lecture at 6.30. And you must bring a skipping rope and tarts. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's, on, it's on exercise. <laughs> cool, thank you. No, I, can. I wonder, would you mind if I prayed with you guys? Is that, is that right for everybody? I'll just pray for us, just especially in the light of that first slide. I think, you know, we need to think about our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being a bit more. And um, so I'd like to pray for you, if that's okay. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being here together as beings created by you and made for a purpose. I thank you that no one knows better uh, how to give us good health than you do. I thank you that you made us for energy and vitality and life. And thank you that it's as we align ourselves with your plans for us and your purpose in making us that we find true, true life and meaning. I pray that you'd give us rest and peace uh, by coming into your presence. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Uh, Wednesday. Sorry.